Welcome to our 2018 budget presentation. My name is Kevin Thomas. I'm one of the tax directors in the Chelmsford office of Ricard Bucket. And it's my pleasure to act as the anchor man here today and welcome you all, many of you who have come back time and time again to another budget presentation. Uh, so yes, as mentioned, uh, I'm the head of macroeconomics at CBR and what I um, would like to talk about today um, is just listed there. So I'll start off with a bit of an overview of sort of the latest on the UK economy. Um, where we stand, I'll sort of start with a more high level picture and then um, go in a bit more detail. Um, and then I'll talk about some of our forecasts for the future and what we see happening in coming years. Um, and given the sort of looming Brexit negotiations, um, I'll present our forecast under three different Brexit scenarios, which I'll um, explain beforehand. And then um, I know that most people here are based in Essex, so I'll wrap up with a bit of a more zoomed in focus on the east of England and on Essex. Um, and I'll try leaving um, just under 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, Q&A at the end. Um, and I'd just like to, um, to wrap up by talking about some future prospects um, that are more specifically targeted at the East and at the regional picture. So here we see our GBA growth forecast from 2018 to 2022 for each region um, in the country. And we actually expect <coughs> Excuse me, East of England to be the fastest growing region. Um, a lot of the forecasts are driven by the composition of the industries that are most heavily represented in the area. So areas like tech and life sciences in the East of England and also their uh, proximity to the capital we expect to drive growth. So that's our sort of four-year outlook. In terms of our very near-term outlook for the next year, the next two years, we actually expect the two areas in the Midlands, the East and West of Midlands, to perform the most strongly. Part of that is because some of the government focus that used to be on the Northern Powerhouse has shifted to the Midlands engine, so we've seen investment, for example, of 69 million promised to the Midlands to boost productivity. Um, so some of this government spending should help those businesses. Um, of course, it's important to keep in mind that sort of the base starting points for a lot of these regions are very different. Um, so you still have areas that are sort of surrounding London, um, sort of performing differently now, performing with that sort of more absolute measures. And then, so going in even more specifically on Essex, we see here um, some local authorities around Essex. And um, I do want to point out, in terms of this ranking, sort of it's a bit of a danger whenever you put a ranking uh, on a slide, people get really focused on you know who's number one and who's in the last place. Um, but I mean, the, the range there goes from just under seven to just over seven. So it's kind of a rel relatively um, similar pictures for all areas. But we do expect the fastest growth rate in areas around West Essex. And I think for us, Essex is a really interesting area to kind of give economic commentary and make economic forecasts for, because for an area that's so close together geographically, it's actually rather diverse. You sort of have the north-south uh, M11 corridor. You, sort of, you don't have that, that much in common, economically speaking, in terms of industries. Um, between the different areas. So we see these areas that are sort of lo located more along the Cambridge corridor um, that have very high quality housing, um, you know, a very sort of cultivated, very skilled workforce, and then basically have the, already have the infrastructure and all the ingredients to grow. Um, and we expect those areas in West Essex to perform the best in the coming years. But we are also aware, and actually CBR is doing um, a lot of work for North Essex and looking at their own economic uh, regeneration efforts, particularly in terms of boosting transport links. So um, a lot of potential um, among other areas as well. Oh, Brexit. Yes, we do want to talk about Brexit. Perhaps we don't. Um, Arthur Askey once said that a number of his fellow entertainers were two jokes and a song from the poor house. And I'm starting to know how they feel, because here for, I think it's the third year running, what's gonna happen, Brexit? <laughs> and anybody who tries to sell you a course to tell you what's going to happen is either a liar or a liar. Now, as Nina's pointed out, there are several options within the, within the Brexit world. Um, but to, 
turn to some realities, one of the things that could really help you is EORR, Economic Operator Registration Indicator. Currently, if you're bringing in goods from outside the EU and it's an import, you will need an EORI to declare when the goods are imported. And if you require goods from the member states, you don't, because that's not an import. We are a single market currently, and that is just an acquisition. So imagine that when we get to the 29th of March next year, everything is an import. You're going to need an EORI. Now I've been told that these applications are being dealt with by two ladies in an office in Cardiff. And the pile of applications is going up like this. So you don't want to be the one at the bottom on the 28th of March. If you are bringing in goods from the EU, it's no skin off your nose to actually just apply for the EORR. If you don't need it, you don't use it. It's nothing in terms of any real admin or extra cost for you. If you are in the business of bringing in goods, get yourself an EORI or talk to me about getting one for you. One of the other alternatives is something that I'm starting to actually gather information from all our MGI colleagues. Now MGI is an international network of accountants. You can imagine how exciting those meetings are. Um, and with Paul Binder, who's the European head, I've going out to the various European member states to ask them questions about how much it costs to register, set up businesses, and some real questions like, well, how long will it take to get your VAT back? What's the actual situation like? We're currently collating all that information together. But myself and uh, one of the directors, Bill, who we were at a client a couple of weeks ago, weren't we? And we're finding that there's a number of businesses who are thinking, this is the way to get around Brexit system of setting up the VAT and other taxes in a member state and therefore we're often running into a single market. Even though it's all meant to be one happy family, there's different rules for different member states. Don't assume that the VAT rules in the UK will mirror the VAT rules in any other member state. They won't. There are significant differences and so therefore you need the local knowledge to make sure that you're not entering from the frying pan into the fire. Probably the most unexpected announcement, or one of the most unexpected announcements on my part, concerned capital allowances and this massive simplification for the vast majority of Ricard Luckin's clients, uh, many of whom are in excess of the £200,000 of annual capital expenditure on plants and equipment, uh, but are below the million pound uh, limit that's coming in uh, from January. It's only coming in for two years, but it's quite a, a welcome measure. Uh, so the annual investment allowance is the amount of 100% write down against tax or profits that you can get for qualifying capital expenditure in the tax return covering the year of, that, uh, of those costs. Um, what I've picked up on this slide that I want to array, want to raise though, is that. Um, there's quite strict rules regarding the timing of expenditure and when the new um, extra allowance comes into effect. So the example there is a, is a financial year to 31 March 2019, uh, where you have nine months of the old limit, 200,000, so that's 150,000 uh, allowance for, for that part. The next three months, uh, you've got a million, but only three months of it, so that's 250,000. Add the two together, an overall allowance of 400,000. Yay! But we can't actually use all of it in the first nine months. You can only use 200,000 in the first nine months. So the timing of the expenditure around 31 December at 18 is going to be quite critical in terms of benefiting from that, that relief. The other really significant thing I think is this new structures and buildings allowance that's coming in. So um, the uh, obviously the devil will be in the detail, the finance bill is due to be published next week and I'll be keenly looking at this bit in particular to try and work out how this is going to work. But very broadly, where a, a business um, incurs cost in relation to a new commercial property, so either constructs the property themselves uh, and it's a capital cost, so a property they're going to let out or, or self-occupy as a business, 
um, or indeed a new commercial property that's bought off of a developer, there's this potential to claim a big proportion of that purchase cost as uh, SBA, Structures and Buildings Allowances, which you're going to get a 2% per annum thick straight line writing down allowance against corporation tax, which sounds quite exciting. We've got these three typical reliefs that people use, particularly for lifetime giving, so you can give £3,000 to anybody, to companies, to trust, anything else in a year, as a maximum they have no inheritance tax to pay on that transfer, and no potential inheritance tax to pay even if you die in the classic seven year old done. You can also make a £250 small gift, and that's per recipient rather than per person. So if you have you know, 10 grandchildren, you want to give them £250 each, you can do that. It's completely fine, even if you know you die the day after, there's still no tax to pay on that. Um, the third relief is actually probably the best ISP relief, um, which is a mutual gift out surplus income. So if you are you look at your income, your cost of living, you know, your taxes, all of that, and you still have a bit left. You can give that, you know, as a regular gift, maybe a yearly large gift to people's Christmas presents, or you know, monthly or quarterly gifts, and you can do that completely tax free. So there's no IHT on the gift, there's no IHT when you die or anything else. The only point with that relief is the revenue don't like it all that much, funnily enough, um, and they do ask for a lot of evidence when someone is filling out the state to prove that you qualify. So if you are thinking of making use of that, it's probably worth having a chat with us and we can set you up with some sort of spreadsheet or table that you may want to use to evidence it to make it easier when somebody's actually coming to claim the relief.